All right, so this is a, a pretty uh, in-depth look at some of the data from a top fuel car. Uh, I have to thank Scott Palmer and obviously the Tommy Thompson Motorsports uh, Mark Recycling team for allowing me to show this and be privy to it. Um, but it's pretty cool. I was fairly impressed with how this worked. So this uh, this Scott Palmer ultimate fan experience thing is really working out for me. So anyway, uh, we have a couple of three traces up here from the car on the qualifying run that it made the other day in Gainesville. And one of the most impressive ones, let me just go over what they are. So first of all, this, this, uh, this teal colored line here is engine RPM. So this is the engine idling. And then obviously when Alex hits the throttle, it jumps up here to Oh, about 8,500 RPM. And then there's a little bit of a power management that happens here about about second off the starting line to keep it from shaking the tires. And then uh, as a clutch applies, it pulls the engine down and then eventually it becomes one-to-one -one with the drive shaft. Remember this thing doesn't have any gears in it. So it's a high gear only. And uh, as the engine runs out the back, you see the engine speed come up uh, and the manifold pressure boost is depicted here with the orange line. And obviously the Orange line is gonna follow what the RPM is doing since they're basically geared together with a belt. Um, and what's really impressive to me with this mechanical injection system is this pink line, which shows the volume that the engine uses per revolution. So this is effectively uh, the engine's volumetric efficiency curve. And you can see that uh, number one, first of all, with the mechanical system, they've managed to come up with effectively an accelerator pump, right? So you have this, this uh, fuel used that it gets delivered to the engine, spikes way up as they roll the throttle open, leaving the starting line. And then the engine climbs up to 8,000. They've got a pretty consistent amount of fuel volume with the boost they've got. And then as the engine load goes up and it pulls the RPM down towards the torque peak where the volumetric efficiency is higher, the fuel volume per per cycle, let's say, uh, or the, the volumetric efficiency climbs. So the fuel per, per cycle goes up. And then as the revs go up at the other end of the track, the fuel volume starts to drop, just like you would expect with any EFI system. And if you look at the shape of that pink line from one end of the run to the other, you're going to recognize that shape if you've ever tuned in uh, electronic fuel injection system, EFI management system on an engine. Uh, that shape is very, very similar to what you see uh, in your volumetric efficiency curve. So it's pretty impressive the number of things they have to keep track of on these cars and also the control that they've managed to develop over the years uh, for these kinds of engines. And it's actually quite sophisticated, even though it's uh, relatively primitive compared to turning an EFI injector on and off. So anyway, that's an inside look at some data from an actual top fuel run that ran uh, 385 and uh, qualified here in Gainesville. Now here's where things get really interesting. They basically use this spreadsheet to keep track of all of the information about the engine itself. Now this is completely different to what I'm used to and I was totally astonished at the level of detail they're using in order to tune these engines. So basically the way it works is they measure the compression height of the piston and rod assembly for every piston and rod. And then they measure the deck height of the block that they're using. And they have the deck height is part of this, this spreadsheet that's been created where they can enter the values for the current engine uh, and then enter the values based on the uh, deck height, the compression height of the pistons, and then the combustion chamber volume so that they can adjust the compression ratio based on mostly what looked like barometric pressure. So as barometric pressure changes, they'll vary the compression ratio uh, of the engine overall uh, and then adjust the blower overdrive so that they effectively always maintain the same kind of pressure in the cylinder. And I think that's done because it allows them to run basically the same fuel curve um, in the engine and they basically build change the engine spec itself with to, to match the changes in the atmospheric conditions uh, which is which is way different and also much much more complex if you think about it um, you know you're trying to maintain 
an exact compression ratio for the engine, but every cylinder has a little bit of a variance in deck height, not deck height. The deck height will vary left side to right on the block, or at least it should only vary left to right on the block, or maybe not at all. Um, but you got small combustion chamber variances from cylinder to cylinder and potentially small compression height differences in, you know, connecting rod lengths uh, and pistons. And that small variation uh, has to be tracked and then accounted for. And this spreadsheet allows them to do that. So basically, this spreadsheet's tied into the weather station that's up on top of the transporter, measuring the atmospheric conditions every 10 minutes. Uh, and then that sample is brought into the spreadsheet and it allows them to, once they have known measurements for the parts in the engine, determine based on the current at atmospheric conditions, what head gasket thickness to use in order to sort of normalize the physical compression ratio of the engine. And also then what overdrive to use along with that gasket thickness or that compression ratio. So those items are varied um, again, run to run. And then because of the time limit between rounds now, and because the parts are so, uh, easy to damage, no one takes the engine apart and checks parts, uh, and just make sure they're good and, and then put them back in the engine. They just simply take all the, the parts out of the engine, uh, and replace them with new ones. So what I mean by that is even if no damage occurs, they're at least going to take the connecting rods and pistons out every run and change them for another set. It's called a rack, right? A rack of eight rods and pistons. Well, they'll measure those racks and have them all laid out based on elimination rounds before the day even starts. And then they know from one round to the next, when they change to the new rack, what the new change in compression height is. And therefore, also based on the weather, uh, and the weather change, uh, which head gasket to use. Now, the really tremendously interesting part of this is that you have to do all of this with enough time to be able to actually bolt the engine back together. So that means you effectively have to guess at what the weather's going to be when you go to the starting line, which makes it just that much more difficult. I was blown away at the complexity involved in making just a simple decision like that for one of these cars super super critical to get everything right and obviously you can see there's lots of opportunity to make mistakes so in my opinion that just makes it that much more impressive that these guys are able to make these kind of decisions um you know week in and week out and have the level of success that they do uh the guys that are tuning these cars in this sport i have a profoundly different respect for what they have to uh keep track of and the number of very, very small details that are involved in making a decision to, to tune one of these cars. I think it really basically just makes what I do day in, day out look like child's play in comparison.
These top fuel dragsters use a multi-lever clutch. They use the same thing in a funny car, but what happens is they basically have lots of fingers, about 18 of them it appears, and each one of them has a counterweight mounted to it in such a way that centrifugal force from engine RPM attempts to make the clutch uh, cu couple itself. In other words, the clutch slips when it leaves the starting line and through centrifugal force and through these levers and the shape of these levers, uh, it applies force to the clutch. Now, holding all of this back from happening immediately is a uh, electro-pneumatically controlled hydraulic cylinder that has a bearing that rides on the center of this clutch, on the center of the fingers. And that prevents them from applying their force centrifugally and locking the clutch. And then the control of that hydraulic ram, which is done using electromagnetic solenoids and, and CO2 air pressure, uh, is programmed in before the run so that you can control the rate at which the clutch couples the engine to the tires based on the level of grip you've got available on the racetrack. So this is what led to us spinning the tires. The number 11 finger, which we're pointing out here in the picture, broke in half. And because it broke in half, the bearing that holds onto the center of all of those fingers, preventing them from just coming on whenever they want to, couldn't control that finger anymore. And that finger then added more clutch uh, and or more coupling between the engine and the tire at the wrong time, which is why the tire spun. Fun fact number one, the engine consumes about five gallons per minute of nitromethane while it's idling. Now, to put that in some sort of perspective, imagine you took a 12-ounce uh, frosty beverage of your choice uh, and, and tried to keep up with the demand of the engine. You would have to pour an entire 12-ounce can in the engine every 1.12 seconds in order to meet the fuel requirement just to idle. One very unique thing about the SPR team is they still whack the throttle uh, during the warm-up. That's where you hear the engine rev up as they blip the throttle once. It's a super exciting thing as a fan to be able to uh, experience something like that. Um, and Scott recognizes that. And so whether or not it causes him a performance disadvantage, he's willing to accept that risk uh, just because of the cool factor. But fun fact number two is that when the whack happens in the pits, the engine, which idles around 2,500 RPM normally, uh, revs up to about 52 to 5,500 RPM during the whack. Often people talk about the peak fuel volume that these engines consume when they're going down the racetrack. Down near the other end of the track, the finish line, where they're using a maximum volume, we measure 85 gallons per minute entering the engine. To put this into EFI terms, 85 gallons a minute at 3,800 cc's per gallon roughly comes out to 323,000 cc's per minute total for the engine, or around 40,375 cc's per minute per cylinder. To e equal that volume, it would take 12 Injector Dynamics ID2600s, or about five of the largest billet atomizers per cylinder.
Another number that astounded me about this thing was down at the other end of the track when it's got all the fuel going in it, the fuel pressure is 550 PSI, which is pretty huge. I had to check it twice to make sure it wasn't KPA. When these cars first leave the starting line, the intake manifold pressure, which is at about three inches of vacuum at an idle, jumps up to about 50 to 55 pounds of boost. That's the orange line depicted on the graph. At the other end of the racetrack, where the engine is connected one-to-one -one with the rear axle, uh, the manifold pressure goes up to about 60 pounds, and that's because it's got 300 mile per hour air assisting the supercharger inlet uh, so that it can make more pressure. Meanwhile, the ignition advance also is in the 50s when you first hit the throttle. The timing comes down in the 30s where you see the RPM have a little dip around one second just to manage wheel speed. And then it's slowly advanced back to around 50 degrees up at about two and a half seconds. After that, there's a safety mandated timing retard which pulls 20 degrees per second out of the ignition advance curve from three seconds on. So that keeps the speeds down of these cars um, for safety. All right, so I really want to send out a sincere thank you to everyone on the SPR team, from Crystal to Jim, uh, Fast Eddie, um, Bob, uh, Bobby Cardoza, uh, Peaches, uh, Alex Laughlin, and of course, Rick and, and Scott. Um, you know, I, I get to race with these guys in the Midwest Drag Racing Series in Pro Mod. Uh, they, they race there with one of their clients, and I race there with one of mine. And I've really gotten to know them over the last couple of years. Um, and, uh, man, I just, every time we get together, we have more and more fun. And I'm, I'm just really appreciative of their friendship and thankful for the opportunity they've given me here. And uh, I look forward to hopefully somehow paying them back.